All right, everybody can see the screen here? Yep. Yes, Great. we can. Awesome. So today, welcome to Book of the Month, book number 14. Today, we are going to be discussing blue ocean strategy. And we can see there's a blue ocean, but oh, there's also the red ocean. Um, so before we jump into our discussion, I wanted to kind of give everybody a quick refresher because I know that we've had a couple of months, um, like uh, it was like the two months to read. So some people read earlier, some people read halfway through, some people read closer um, a little bit recently. So here's just a quick little refresher about what we read. And then we're gonna be opening up the floor and continuing the discussion. So Blue Ocean Strategy is the pursuit of a differentiation of a low cost to open up a new market space and create new demand. It's about creating and capturing uncontested market space, thereby making the competition irrelevant. It's based on the view that market boundaries and industry structure are not a given and can be reconstructed by the actions and belief of industry players. So this is like a really jargony way to summarize like, what the entire thing was about. So e, how would you explain Blue Ocean strategy um, in its simplest terms to maybe even like uh, a Zaid aged kid or um, Jackie's kid in a couple of years? It's a little bit of like think outside the box, right? And focus more on what you can do better to stand out rather than what everyone else is doing, right? Like, in, in generally speaking, yeah. I think Blue Ocean, like the comparison between the two, like Blue Ocean is obviously a, a market with uh, not a lot of competition, so it has a lot of opportunity to be unique and bring something new to the table. Whereas the Red Ocean is like a highly saturated market where you need different types of strategies to to kind of tap in and and you know be a, a valuable player in that market. So. And I think just finding that niche that like with your own skills and talents that you're you're really good at, like focus on that so you can find that niche that no one else is really maybe focusing on. I see like I see Blue Ocean as like you're almost like the term gets thrown around a lot more recently, like disruption, right? Like you're kind of disrupting an industry, but not like in a technologically innovative way, but more in like a it could be technologically innovative, but it's more on like maybe a customer service innovation or a product innovation, or uh, like, an, like an approach to servicing your clients, uh, right? So um, I would say like creating a new space within uh, an existing industry. Could also be around finding what you already do, highlighting those things as the things that you do that no one else is really doing yet or not talking about and using those things to leverage an advantage as well. A bit like the stuff we went over during our uh, FY24 planning conversation. Yeah. I would say if I have to explain Jackie's kid, then it would be like, you know, don't, Blue Ocean strategy is like, do not, it's almost like don't follow the crowd. Don't just go ahead and, stand behind a queue, just create your own queue, you know, mm. just stand out and try to create your own queue instead of just joining another one. I like that. This is awesome. Does anybody else have any other um, short kind of easy to digest summaries of what the book is all about? I think um, uh, I would say that, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Roy. Um, I would say that the Red Ocean is very crowded and you're bumping into other boats and um, rather than competing in that space you should set sail for the blue waters and uh, where nobody is and um, that way you can thrive so rather than competing with the competition you basically just make them irrelevant uh, um, i was gonna say um it also like really thinking about a potentially underserved or untapped audience as well and um, coming at them from like a completely different direction and hitting them with something that they didn't even know that they want or needed and um, kind of like 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, and then making it your own little niche product, I guess, essentially. So really thinking about that audience in mind and keeping them in mind at the forefront. Mm-hmm. And presumably the advantage is that there is probably more fish in the blue ocean versus the red ocean because everybody's all going for the same fish in that red ocean. Right. Yeah, like a bigger slice of the potential proverbial pie, kind of, yeah. Great, these are all awesome, and they're all a great segue. Oh, that didn't segue. To this, which is the red ocean versus the blue ocean in a big fight. Um, so based on some of the stuff that we read in the book, there are some really good examples about um red oceans and blue oceans and companies that have successfully found their blue ocean. Um, my favorite was Cirque du, so- du Soleil. The, I don't know how to say it. Cirque du Soleil. <laughs> the Cirque du Soleil. One. That was my absolute favorite example because I love Cirque was. It's great. Uh, so Christina, what made it like your favorite? I, oh, sorry. I had to Google what they were. <laughs> oh, um, what made it my favorite is like, I loved Cirque du Soleil my whole life. And it's like, I feel like I grew up with it. So I didn't realize that it was like a blue ocean because it was just what I was used to. But then when I read all these examples about like how authentic services had, uh, circuses, services, circuses had like uncomfortable seating and animals and focused on all of these um, very famous performers and how like through the time Cirque du Soleil kind of involved, evolved and you know, got rid of like the animals because like that was kind of becoming taboo, but got like comfier seats in and they focused on a storyline in the circus, which had never happened before. Like it was so interesting to see those examples because I could relate because I could be like, yeah, I do really love that about them. So yeah, I just thought it was like a really great example of how they kind of made the circus their own thing from what it used to be. Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah, totally. And I think as well, to add to that, Christina, I thought it was interesting that they also realised that they had to kind of give it uh, the, the side, sort of appearance that everybody would expect from a circus so they could identify that it was yeah, something. Yeah, they talk about how that's like the one thing they kept were like the tents and stuff. It's yeah. like so interesting because I never thought about it that way and it kind of like blew my mind. I also think it's funny too that like in the way that Cirque du Soleil functions is that they have probably a lot like lower of an overall cost of running a circus compared to like animals and trainers and everything too. And yet they can probably charge four times the price just because of the premium venue and have like 10 times the audience, you know, I mean, like the Vegas residency and everything. I worked at the Canadian Tire Center when they used to come like every year for seasons and like I can just remember like they would put on like five shows and they'd be sold out in Ottawa like that never happened so it was pretty cool yeah and actually that's that's a great point reducing the costs of managing the animals looking after them and the the staff as well that are there to look after the animals that would be an example of um reducing something in the in the four paths framework uh reducing is one of the one of those uh one of those areas of focus so you know I, I think that um that was a smart move were there any other examples that anyone wanted to mention because the aside from Cirque to the circus one um that they were maybe that was your favorite one or if there's another favorite, or was there one that you didn't like at all um the floor is yours uh, I really like the wine. I think um, like when they spoke about like how wine is like very intimidating and you need to go into it and like there's so much jargon. I was like, oh, I, I like I feel like I would like be a good target audience for that because I couldn't care less about like where it's made and how it's aged. And I just I just want something that tastes good. And I think um, the yellowtail example was like really good where they were like, I think it must have taken like a lot of courage to say everyone's everyone in our industry is like talking about these big words and they care about all these terms let's not even focus on that and let's just give people something that's easy when everyone was being like everyone else was being so pompous and like self-important like about their wines and they were like I think I really like that example because I think it was it I can't imagine like how they came up with it but like I think it must have taken like a lot of like courage to say all right we're not caring about this and then the they had like this two page summary on like their results in this area and that area I don't remember all the numbers but 
like the success kind of spoke for itself. I really like that example. I agree. I think taking the stigma off of it, um, because people were too afraid to to go and buy wine and try it because they were afraid of looking stupid because they didn't know enough about it or like, you know, what things are supposed to smell or whatever. And and just taking that stigma away, then yeah, people weren't afraid to buy it anymore and actually realized they like wine. <laughs> I think my favorite was five hour energy. I thought that one was so interesting just because every time you walk into like a 7-Eleven, you see that five hour energy thing on the front uh, near the cashier. So I just found it interesting how they like the first thing was like energy drinks, like they changed the game by changing the the can. Right. So they had the like tall, skinny cans, which was like um, kind of like the trendy thing to do. So then five hour energy took it the next step and made the, the two milliliter little bottles. Um, so I just I like that one as well. Mm -hmm. anybody else or shall we oh okay my computer has decided um it is now <laughs> to time for a much bigger discussion and as you can see this is blue ocean strategy and if anybody knows me as an individual, I love fish. And if there's any excuse to include fish in anything and as it relates to oceans where the fish reside, we are no longer in group numbers, we are in group fish. So there is group lobster, group dolphin, and group turtle. So um, each of these groups, you're gonna be divided automatically through the magic of Zoom and you will have the discussion. So. Um, I would highly recommend taking a screenshot of this or a little picture with your phone because uh, they are a bit lengthy of questions. Um, and so you're just going to discuss your topic in your group. So if you're a group lobster, you're only going to kind of discuss the lobster's topic. Whereas if you're group turtle, then you're going to discuss the turtle's topic. And of course, the dolphin. I don't want to leave the dolphin out either. So <laughs> um, does anybody have any questions about the... Um, the groups, the questions, or anything else before I let Zoom send you all into groups? How will we know which group we're in? Um, so I'm going to make Zoom assign it, and then I'm going to tell you before I send you out. Um, but I may struggle a little bit with technology, so um, yeah. if it doesn't go, I'll hop into the room and let you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, has everybody taken a picture of this? Yep. Yep. Great, so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here and please bear with me. We are going to make three, three, eight. All right. So I'm just gonna have to move this aside, sorry. I don't know, how, there we go. All right, so for the first group, which is room number one, it will be group lobster. So this is Adam, Allison, Carla, Matthias, and Basfi. For group number two, you're going to be group turtle. So that's Fernando, Khalil, Leslie, and Michael. And for group three, you're going to be group dolphin, which is Christina, Riaz, Roy, and Sonali. And I will make my little drop in because I would love to discuss all this with everybody as well. So I'm going to open up all the rooms and I'm going to set a timer for 15 minutes. And I'm going to do my best to make sure it is 15 minutes because last time I don't know why it didn't do 15 minutes, but it looks like it will. So I'm going to open all the rooms now and have a great lively discussion. Well, welcome back. I hope everybody had a super fun discussion. I, I know that I enjoyed being a little, I don't know what the equivalent of like the C version of a fly is on the wall, but that's what I'm kind of going for, like a fly on the wall, but it's like ocean related. Um, uh, barnacle? Urchin on the bottom of a boat or something. Yeah. I was like the urchin. Yeah, I, I like the urchin because those those are. Um, I was the urchin on the um in each of the groups, so it was very fun to kind of hear the discussions. So, uh, what we're gonna do is I'm going to randomly pick one of the groups, um, to go first because I don't want to do one, two, three or anything like that. It's too standard. So, first we are going to go with group. Da -da 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 -da. Dolphin, group dolphin. I which, knew it. <laughs> which is Christina, Riaz, Roy, and Sonali. It was unintentional that a bunch of managers got into one group. It wasn't me, it was Zoom. It wasn't me, it was Zoom. Zoom knows. Yeah. Zoom knows. All good, all good. I um, just knew that you were going to pick Team Dolphin. Go ahead, Diana. Um, yeah. yeah, no worries. I'm 
just going to read out what your prompt was. Um, and then dolphins, you are ready to share. So the dolphins topic was how can individuals apply the concept of blue oceans to their personal lives or careers? Are there any lessons that can be learned from companies that have successfully created new markets? The floor, the ocean is open for you, dolphins. Thank you, Ileana. So I am the person who took notes, so I'm gonna talk, but Riaz, Christina, Roy, please feel free to jump in. Mm -hmm. um, so we discussed about a lot of our real life examples from the present, from the past, and how we have applied or, or plan to apply the blue ocean strategy. Um, Roy spoke about, um, you know, during pandemic, uh, there was a lot of uh, there was a lot of demand in the developers market and uh, how he chose and Roy correct me if I'm wrong he chose uh, a technology views to to stand out and and beat the competition and he mentioned that there was um, there was a there was a similar technology which was very very close but he chose this one um, and um, fortunately he beat the competition there and add puzzle fortunately was was also using this technology because of a, because of which he landed the job in CDIO correct Roy if I'm I, I you hope nailed I'm... it one hundred percent okay perfect Riaz. Uh, spoke about it. it was very interesting Ria spoke about um, how um, our team is so diverse and he said that um, you know he always always um, we, we are never sh we never shy away from expressing ourselves and uh, while sometimes we wonder I think I was talking to Michael when I joined the team that I sometimes want oh maybe not maybe I was talking to Riaz that how come I feel like all of us have very very similar personality i guess now i understand like we are literally handpicked but um that's true though he said that he 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 obviously looks at the resume but like he doesn't give a lot of importance to to the resume he thinks that he he chooses individual who are not um shy to kind of express themselves right like to have their own voice and opinion so that was uh, that was uh, riaz's uh, point there i gave an example of like um how we in the in the performance world uh, um we we always have been taught or told that these are the xyz things which is going to work these are the xyz things which are like which should be uh, your winning formula for for facebook ads or linkedin ads or or google ads but um i don't think so and i can speak on behalf of uh, fernando and vasvi as well that we never shy away to test and try new things, to experiment new things. Um, that doesn't mean we uh, kind of not follow the best practices. Yes, we do follow the best practices, but we never ever shy away from trying new things, right? To test new things. Um, um, and then um, Riaz also spoke about uh, when he was um, starting his business, how he applied the blue ocean strategy there because there was not a lot of agency who did uh, lead generation at that time and um, although everybody thought that why is he uh, leaving his absolutely stable job and and going for a business but he did that and um, look at us look at all of us today right uh, just because just began thank you Riaz just because you took that step we are here now Christina why don't I let you talk about your YMC example I think mm -hmm. that was very interesting and I don't want to butcher it yeah okay sure so um my example was about uh, my internship in university so um in uni uh, we all had to go uh, do a six-month internship um and uh, kind of like um come up with a whole program for a certain place and there was a list uh, that all of the graduates from the program had gone to. So the same places every year that you had to choose from. And it was things kind of like nursing homes and a few other things that I can't really remember, to be honest, hospitality stuff a bit. And um, I really wanted to do mine more for like a nonprofit or like an organization, because that's what I was interested in. So um, I chose to try to do it at the YMCA. And even though like my professor was actually pretty negative about it, um, and was just like, it's not really attainable, just follow the flow of what we've been doing for years. Um, I, I did end up doing that and I ended up getting it and it was like a very positive experience. And I felt like I was able to share what our, um, our program in university was able to do for like this whole, this whole industry that we hadn't tapped into at all. And so now the YMCA is on that list and I'm hoping that others are having really positive experiences. Yeah. Love it. 
Right. Um, Thank you, team. Oh, sorry. Oh no, I just wanted to share one one last uh, couple of things. So I took a couple of notes here. So one of the other like because uh, the second part of the question was around like the lessons, right? Um, so one of the things that we talked about is like going against the grain of what's universally accepted and the universally accepted standard and how that can be very scary. But that is like understanding the the concept of blue ocean strategy, I think is pretty simple, right? Like, I mean, once you, especially after you've read like the book, right? But I think the actual application of it is can be very um, painstaking and quite, you're, you, you're afraid of actually uh, of, the fear of judgment is real, right? Uh, because if we're doing something very different, then it's going to be easy for those in the red ocean strategy to say, oh, look at those people over there. Like they, they're out to lunch. They don't know what they're doing. But meanwhile, we have a blue ocean strategy around it. Right. So and at the individual level, which is what our question was around, you know, it's not easy to uh, not fear judgment. Like when you're putting yourself out there, it's easy to for you to be like, you know, are people laughing at me or, you know, you, people get afraid of like how they're perceived if they're not uh, confident in their, uh, in their approach there. So going against the grain from what's universally accepted, uh, following your intuition, uh, diversity of opinions, expressing yourself through, you know, fashion, music, uh, conversations, opinions, it's, these are all important things and lessons that we took away. Great. Thank you, Team Dolphin. Is there anything else, Team Dolphin, that you wanted to mention before we Pick another team to speak. We were fabulous, I guess. Oh yeah, <laughs> fabulous indeed. So thank you so much, the dolphin team. You are blue, blue oceans and dolphins, it connects. So speaking of blue, now let's talk about red. And we know that lobsters are red. So team lobster, uh, this is, uh, at, oh. <laughs> That yes. is beautiful. I love that. Um, so that's <laughs> that's Team Dolphin. That's Adam, Allison, Carla, Matias, and Vaspi. Sorry, Team Lobster, my mistake. Um, and the lobster topic is how do you think the concept of red oceans applies to the industries that are heavily, heavily regulated or have high barriers to entry? Can companies still find ways to differentiate themselves in these markets? If so, how? Lobsters? Thank you. Um, so we first uh, chatted about what kinds of industries, uh, just to give us some examples. So some of the heavily regulated industries that we thought of were medical, alcohol, uh, guns, um, gambling, tobacco, vaping, uh, housing, real estate, um, and I'm sure that uh, there's many, many more, but we kind of went down the road of these uh, particular industries. Um, so these ones are obviously super regulated and the only ways to really differentiate yourself we found were kind of four, four different options or be uh, finding a way to make it cheaper, uh, create trends, um, versions. So, um, like an eco-friendly or a charitable version or something that's different outside of the box than what's currently being done. Um, and then creating something completely new where it wasn't before. And then um, influence, who owns it, who buys it. We were talking about the senators there being for sale. Obviously, influence of some, you know, celebrities in there has obviously swayed some things recently. Um, so, uh, a few of the examples that we had for finding a way to make it cheaper uh, when it came to alcohol, we were thinking of like, you know, like five to 10 years ago, I don't really think we saw too many pre-mixed cocktails at the LCBO. And thinking about that, it's quite a bit less alcohol for, let's say, your average vodka company to put in a pre-mixed cocktail. They're making a much higher percentage on that beverage, selling more, higher quantity than it would at selling potentially a bottle of vodka. Um, so that was kind of one example that we thought of. Um, we were also thinking of, uh, sorry, Adam, did you want to add anything? No, I was just going to just note on, on actually it was Allison's point about vaping, how like that kind of came into the tobacco industry and kind of revolutionized it, right? Like, and kind of went a whole different direction. Again, it's still in that same bucket of tobacco and smoking to an extent, but that they kind of like came in, kicked the door in, we're like, we're going this way. 
and mm -hmm. uh, and just just seeing how prevalent it is, you know, in high school and and with uh, teenagers and even older people, you know, using vapes and stuff. So um, it was it was I think it was a great great example. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and then um, we also said uh, creating something completely new. So. Uh, medical, we thought of a few examples like during COVID, um, you know, creating a vaccine, creating something uh, that wasn't there before and obviously um, capitalizing on that. Um, and then we can also think of Pfizer creating a blue pill just by chance years ago and like completely disrupting the market and creating a need where like it never even was thought of before. So um, those were kind of some of the examples that are obviously heavily regulated, but there's lots of ways to be a disruptor. Still, I just want to add for like the creation of something new. So like if you're in like an industry that's heavily regulated, but then you create a new product within that industry, the regulations sort of follow. So you have a little more leeway when you're creating something new. Whereas if, if they've already defined this product needs to have this, this, and this, and this is a regulation, you can't really play around in it. But if you're making something net new, you're kind of going against everyone, like you're making something new and there's really no regulations because it didn't exist before. And then the regulations sort of follow you. That's, uh, and this, we spoke about like how that happened with like cannabis in Canada, where like they, it kind of was just like, it was there. And then like the regulations sort of followed it because they were like, okay, like we need to regulate this because this already exists. So obviously that's maybe not the best example because it wasn't super legal, but like before it got legalized, but like there's other things you can do. So you can like make products that didn't exist. And then obviously if the industry is like that, they will follow you later, but you have a little more like room to breathe to create something new. All right, Carla, back to you. No, yeah, that was beautiful. That was great. That was it. Hey. Anybody else have anything to add from our group? I hope I, any other examples from fellow lobsters? We talked about, we talked about like the power of influence, right? And while I'm not hundred percent sure if it's like a super highly saturated market, the beverage industry where it comes to like sports drinks and uh, hydration beverages, like um, obviously Gatorade, Powerade, that sort of thing. Um, recently two guys with massive followings released a brand new hydration beverage called prime. Uh, it's delicious. I haven't bought Powerade ever since for like a year. I just buy that. Um, and they've actually started to produce more sales than Powerade who've been around for decades and they've only been around for a year and it's just the power of influence. So it's not just about making a whole new product. It's about who makes it and kind of who endorses it. Uh, it's it's one way to disrupt a very saturated market. So, yeah. Neat. Thank you, Team Lobsters. I I love the the little. T -t 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 -t. Although lobsters can be blue, but that's a discussion for a later day. You guys are the red lobsters not trademark. So next up, Holy we got fuck. slow and steady wins the race. And so we know that this must be the team of Turtle. And Team Turtle consists of Fernando, Khalil, Leslie, and Michael, where they had the discussion about what trends have a high pro probability of impact in our industry. They're irreversible and are evolving in a clear trajectory. They discussed what these trends are and how they impact the industry. So over to you, Turtles. Well, we collectively decided um, that AI is the biggest trend and biggest game changer in our market, um, covering everything from graphic design, copy, coding. Um, we think it's very exciting, but scary. But Fernando pointed out it's also fun. It's a fun kind of scary, which it is. Um, it's not going to replace us, but we definitely have to learn it and embrace it and work with it. Um, Michael made a good point that the future hasn't been clear. Obviously, AI is here to stay. Um, and if we can learn the groundwork now, we can be the experts and we can really use this to work for our industry. Um, another thing that was brought up was fake ads. Fernando had mentioned that there was a series of Joe Rogan ads that were sort of floating around um, and none of them were actually him. So we need to be aware of, of the fake thing. We need to learn how to use it properly. We need to be concerned about copywriting. Um, while learning this, we definitely don't want to step on anybody's toes and get in trouble legally. Um, 
And then, oh yeah, Michael was talking about how he was creating um, a smart goal in AI and, and it was a little scary because it almost seemed to know too much. Um, but this is part of the risk with it. Um, we don't know what's going on behind the scenes, but we do have to embrace it. Khalil had mentioned that we need to stay as up-to-date as possible because there are so many new tools coming out constantly and we need to figure out what works for us best so that we can stay ahead of it. And um, a second point we made was remote work. It's definitely become a trend, remote or hybrid work, sorry. Um, and then we were talking about a conspiracy theory, theory that's going around that people who are being forced to go back to the offices is the reason that they're being forced to go back is because of the cost of that office space and that building that um, they need people to be in those buildings to sort of um, justify the cost of it. So yeah, I don't know, Turtles, does anybody wanna add anything? Did I miss anything? <laughs> No, I think you covered it really well, Leslie. Yes. I, I approve the message, Leslie. It was it was voiced very well. <laughs> yeah, they nominated me to speak because I was like lost in cyberspace again when we got broken out into the rooms. And I guess I kind of burst into the room. <laughs> oh yeah, I saw you were like, it, it said that you were like, in, you were floating, like you weren't connected. <laughs> I saw that in the breakout rooms. I was like, that's super weird. I, so I, I clicked I on I you a couple of times. I thought I missed something. So I, I guess I, I came in a little hot. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Thank you so much, Team Turtles. And Fernando, I love the Franklin behind you. That show is a classic. Super cute. Turtle, team Turtle. So I wanted to end off our lovely discussion with uh, a quotable quote with a little fish friend here, mm. uh, which is by questioning conventional definitions of who can and should be the target buyer, companies can often see fundamentally new ways to unlock value. Love it. That's that's where we ended today. Thanks so much for a great discussion. Uh, I will pass it pass it to the lovely management team to reveal the next book of the month. That is a very good question, Ileana. So we don't have a next book, actually. <laughs> oh, that's awkward. <laughs> no, it's not awkward at all. Because okay. what I want is for recommendations from the team. Um, to send to us by Friday. And then on Monday, when we meet as a management team, we will select uh, it. Instead of us always dictating what the book is, we want to crowdsource the book. Has uh, anyone read the book, um, The Paradox of Choice? Send it in. Please submit it. Uh, okay. <laughs> oh, <cool>. oh. <laughs> Question, does it have to be a book or could it be like a group learning opportunity moment? Something slightly or, or a documentary. Yeah. Riazacida.io. Okay. And uh, yeah, so send in your ideas for books because we don't always be like dictating what the book is, uh, even though they've been good. Um, but uh, yeah, I want we want to hear what you have to what what kind of books you want us to to focus on. Cool. So send it by Friday. On Monday we'll chat about it, uh, and then we'll let you know on the team kickoff on Monday. Tuesday, Monday the holiday. Yes, sorry, on on Tuesday. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Great. Nice. Thanks, Eliana. Thanks, everybody. Awesome. Well, thanks, thanks so much. Uh, Bye, guys. I'll see you guys later. Bye. Thank you. Bye, guys.